You're listening to the Business Brave Food Podcast. This is episode 143. Welcome to the Business Brain Food Podcast, the show business owners listen to when they want to take their business to the next level. Head to businessbrainfood.com.au to catch up on past episodes and access show notes from every interview. Now, here's your host, Ben Futrell. to another episode of Business Brain Food. This, my friend, is the podcast that's 100% devoted to taking you and your business to the next level. And the good news is, doesn't matter whether you're brand new to this business thing, so maybe you're just kicking off, scratching that entrepreneurial edge and getting a start, or getting started in business, or maybe you're like myself and you've been in business for a long, long time. Doesn't matter where you're at, there's always something you can do to take your business to the next level. And today is absolutely no different. In fact, today I've got Pete Visk coming on the show, and Pete is going to tell you the three things you must do uh, for your website to be successful. He wrote a book called Why Most Websites Suck, and today, by listening to this podcast, you're going to work out whether or your website sucks, and if it does, what to do about it. Uh, and it's not about getting you down, it's about helping you lift you up, take you to the next level, so really looking forward to that. Now, I did want to say thank you so much for those of you that have left reviews in the iTunes store, really do appreciate it. Uh, if you didn't, if you missed it already last week, I think or the week before, I mentioned that by leaving a review, copy and pasting that review into an email, and emailing it to Ben at maxmyprofit.com.au. I will then send you access to a one hour long training on a website user experience. And it's a training that was only available to our members that it took you through making sure that the user experience on your website was optimized to be able to maximize conversion rates. A really powerful training that is only available to paying members, but I am going to, well, so it's not only available to paying members, it's also available to you uh, because you're a listener of the Business Bravery Podcast that has left a review. So go copy and paste a review, uh, email it to ben at maxmyprofit.com.au and we will give you instant access uh, if you want to get a copy of that training. It's an amazing training and it's going to help take your website to the next level. Now, on to today's podcast. Now, if you're a new listener, by the way, um, sorry to <laughs> jump straight into uh, into that detail uh, that may have bored you. I want to get you excited about what we hated to do today. So as a new listener, welcome along to the Business Bravery Podcast. If you're a returnee, thanks once again for tuning in. Love the fact that you keep coming back. Um, today, as like I said, we we're going to have Pete Vist on the show. Now, Pete is a, uh, a, a, a an Aussie guy from Sydney, so another Sydney sider, although hardly ever in Sydney. He's a keynote speaker that is in demand all over the world, uh, so he's not here very often. So, uh, you know, having won multiple awards over a 20 year career of speaking and presenting, he is in demand with some of the biggest corporations on the planet. So, Pete's not often in Sydney, but today uh, for this interview, he is, which was great. Now, one of the things that Pete does really well is he helps people get their websites working much better. And he has written a book called Why Most Websites Suck. And I think the reality is for most people these days is they don't understand what to do with their website and they're afraid to go to an outside source because of the cost involved with hiring a development company to fix your website up. So, you know, he goes through some tips on how to make sure that you are getting ripped off, how to ensure that your website is working at its optimum, it is going to uh, you know, deliver results to you. Um, some of the mistakes that you may have made gives you a few examples of um, you know things that have not worked well and things that have worked well for businesses. We talk about you know what sort of offers to put on your website. Uh, Pete goes through the three things you must do to make sure that your website performs. So really, really looking forward to this. I think you're going to love Pete. He's a great guy. Uh, fun, you know, a lot of fun to interview, and I think you're going to enjoy this chat. So let's get Pete onto the Business Brain Food Podcast. Business Brain Food. So welcome to the Business Brain Food Podcast, Pete. Mate, pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, it's our pleasure, mate. It's our pleasure to be chatting to you. Good to have a uh, Aussie on the show. I get a good mix of uh, people from all over the world, uh, but it's great to have another Aussie to chat to. Not just an Aussie, but a Sydney sider, even though you're hardly here, eh, mate? Yeah, look, uh, I do Look, I do a bit of travelling. I am guilty as charged there. Just got back from Bali, actually, on Saturday. Half your luck, half your luck. Now, before we do get stuck into having a chat and digging deep about websites and why most websites suck, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask every single guest, and that is for you to share something quirky about yourself. It's time for Something Quirky. And now, Something Quirky. Oh, you're going to love this one, Ben. Uh, In year two, you can't imagine kids are very good at singing, I dare say, but yet somehow in year two in my choir, my school choir, I was asked to mime. To mime? 
Yep, <laughs> my year two choir. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> I didn't expect that at all, Pete. What's um, <laughs> has it? Can I ask? Has it improved? <laughs> Oh, it's outstanding. Some of my karaoke numbers, like Love Shack, oh, you haven't heard anything better. It's received acclaim. Let me guess, the more drinks you have, the better you sound. Oh, no, not at all. I don't know what you're talking about there. It's just, Your Honour, I mean, Ben. <laughs> oh, well, interesting. Well, I've never had that before, mate. In 143 episodes, nobody has told me that they got banned from singing at school, which is pretty much what happened. That was a, what a polite way of saying you're banned from singing. I know, right? That's terrible. <laughs> how, how could you do that to someone in year two? <laughs> well, it sounds like you've been scarred for life. Anyway, um, we could chat about that, but how about we dive deep? Um, you know, you've written a book why most websites suck, and I think you're right. I think a lot of them do suck. Um, <laughs> let's let's start off by having a chat about how you got involved in the world of helping people build better websites. Yeah, it's funny. Um, like, it's a long story, so I'll give you the long version. No, I won't do that to you. <laughs> I won't bore the listeners. It's funny how it started, actually. I, um, I, you know, I've been a professional presenter for many years, been in tourism, uh, spoken on business topics. And then I went out on my own probably about uh, maybe 12 to 15 years ago and started taking on my own business. And I realized in my own businesses, I, I was doing a lot of the tech stuff. So I, I was self-taught with regards to websites. Uh, and then I had a business probably about 10 years ago that uh, I sold out of with a business uh, partner of mine. And when I sold out of that, I kind of sat around twiddling my thumbs and thought, what the heck do I do now? And I just, at that point in time, I was just getting a lot of questions from a lot of other people about their websites. And so I found myself working on other people's websites, other business websites. The next thing you know, I woke up one morning and I'm like, it looks like I've got a website company. How did that happen? <laughs> um, so that's kind of how I got into it. Nothing like having a business by accident. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Weird. But, you know, I, I think it's interesting. So what, what um, I'm interested to know because you went from self-learning to teaching others. Mm. Was, mm. Your, was your website like cracking success and everyone could see that or what was going on there? I think what happened is, uh, uh, you, you know, and the irony was with the websites that I'd created, they weren't, you know, massive successes with, with huge dollar spinners. It's funny because someone came along who uh, sat down with me, one of my first, you know, let's call them semi-major clients, sat down with me and uh, we had a 10-minute conversation and they basically said they'd spent uh, $40,000 on a website 10 years ago um, and they said the developer had just put a bill in front of them for ten grand for a shopping cart. And I sat down with them and I looked at their website and it was built on WordPress and I said, that's awesome. And um, I said, what type of shopping cart did they want to install? And they showed me. And then um, I basically showed them that they, you know, for a developer to install that shopping cart on a website takes about 10 minutes um, mm. and that's about it. And then uh, they went back to their developer and said, hey, look, uh, is this true? What's going on here? And then she sent through a copy of what her updated invoice was and it was, um, thanks so much because you've been such a loyal customer. We'll put this uh, shopping cart in for free as part of our service. And, you know, it started. I started to realize that even though I hadn't scaled websites for myself at that point, the information that I knew was so far superior to what uh, other people knew with regards to working with developers that I could save a lot of other people money and, and it went from saving other people money to figuring out how things actually worked. And I've always been far better at working on other people's projects than my own. Like you give me someone else's project and I'll run at it like a bull at a gate and I'll do some amazing things. But you put my own projects in front of me and I kind of go, yeah, I don't know if I could be bothered. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what do they call the plumber with the leaky tap syndrome, you know? <laughs> like- <laughs> yeah. Guilty as charged. Fix, fix everybody else's taps with their own. Well, that's interesting. So, so can you give us some examples of some of the people that came to you and said, hey, Pete, help me out with my website of some of the things that you did? I mean, there's there's one example. We had a company that was paying a stack of money, and I think that's mm. a that's a common uh, issue, isn't it, for business owners is they, they engage a developer. They don't know what has to be done in the background. It could be 10 minutes of work, and then they're getting charged exorbitant amounts of money. Uh, have you got some other examples of where, how you've sort of helped somebody in a way that's had some some fairly dramatic results? Yeah, so first and foremost, let's just touch on very quickly what you were mentioning there. It, it, it's literally the same as, say, uh, getting a car serviced. 
you know, a lot of people don't, who don't understand how a car works, they'll take a, a vehicle in to be serviced and then they'll get this ridiculous service charge for their vehicle and you don't even know if any work has been done. And in a lot of cases, it's actually a pretty, can be a very deceptive industry and a lot of people are getting overcharged for work that isn't being done. And I know the classic example was a an email that I saw back in the, the day, like in the late 90s when email chains were a, a big thing. And I remember someone mentioned that uh, they posted an image of their receipt from getting their car serviced, and it was a young woman who took a car to get serviced, and one of the items on the receipt was um, a charge to refill the headlamp fluid. <laughs> and, you know, obviously the the person that worked in the garage was, you know, taking the mickey a little bit out of that one, um, trying to be a bit of a, as they'd say, a bit of a smart ass. But then someone figured out that, hey, this is what this person's actually doing and it's quite a questionable practice. And and I, I see that sort of thing going on in the web industry a lot. Now, I'm not saying that if you've got a website, you need to know because people come to me and they say, I'm going to try and build my own website. And the answer is no, no, don't try and build your own website. If you wake up in the morning and you find that there's sewer leaking out of your toilet into your living room, do you try and learn how to fix toilets yourself or do you call a plumber? And the answer is you call a plumber. Well, for the most part, I hope, because one, you know that it's going to be cheaper than you trying to figure it out and do it yourself. And number two, they're going to do a better job. And it's exactly the same with regards to uh, websites. So that's the advice I give everyone. You don't have to learn how to do it yourself. You just have to learn enough information so that you can have a conversation with a developer whereby you won't be overcharged and whereby you will keep control of what's important uh, with your website. Should I get back to your original question, Ben? Yeah, but that's a good <laughs> tip. I think it's a great tip and a good analogy too because I remember the whole uh, auto industry, because of that stigma or that issue where they were charging for things that weren't done, uh, they had to put uh, the parts, the old parts, back on the, uh, you know, they used to put them on the passenger seat floor so they could prove. Mm. So if they said they've charged you for six spark plugs, here's six old spark plugs. Um, but, yeah. I, but I remember one of the current affairs shows uh, catching out people going to the wreckers and buying old parts for next to nothing <laughs> <laughs> to stick on people's floors. We shouldn't laugh, but it happens, right? It uh-huh. happens. People are unscrupulous when it comes to money sometimes. See, I and look, I've never understood this. You know, I do a lot of work with regards to human psychology and it's still something that I don't understand how – um, you know, I don't understand how a human being could actually make a gain at the detriment of another human being. Like, I don't get that. It's not in my DNA, but quite clearly it is in some people's DNAs. And unfortunately, um, you know, the web development game has become the wild, wild west uh, of the modern day. It, it really is. There's so many opportunities for the unscrupulous to make money. You really need to be very careful. And, you know, maybe some of the listeners to your show, when they comment on this, they can make comments about some of the cases that they've had in the past where they feel like they've been ripped off or overcharged or, you know, they've people have tried to lead them down the garden path with regards to what they do need. And, you know, maybe we can hear some of those stories back from some of your listeners just so that people know they're not alone. This happens all the time. Yeah, I'd love to hear that too because I think, I mean, we've, I've heard a lot of stories, but it would be interesting to hear uh, what the listeners have been through. You know what, we'll, we'll come back to my original question because I think um, yeah. we can dive deeper in on this now. I mean, you've, sp- you've yeah. spoken about people learning a bit about websites and, and definitely the importance as to why, but how does somebody mm-hmm. go about getting the basic understanding so they do have an idea of what should have been done and what they should have been charged for? Yeah, so I remember, well, I mean, that's a huge question in itself, but let's kind of backtrack a little bit more again and go yeah. back to the, uh, you know, some of the examples of, of, of real life scenarios that I've worked on. And uh, a lot of people, when they come to me, they don't realize how powerful their website and their web presence is. Now, first of all, if you don't have a website, people are still searching for you online and they're still finding out information about you online. The question is, are you in control of that information? That is vitally important. And a website is the first piece in that uh, jigsaw puzzle. So you need to make sure you have a website from that perspective. Then once you have the website, people say, okay, I've got a website. It's just an online brochure. Rubbish. That is a waste of time and a waste of space. Your website needs to serve a purpose. What do you want people to do after they come to your website? Because as consumers in this world, People love to buy and we love to be led, but we hate to be sold to. 
So don't go sell, 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 but instead build trust. You want to build a bridge between where your current customer or client is and build that bridge across to where you want them to be in order to move forward in a buying relationship. What is going to make this person want to reach into their pocket and actually buy something? So again, I've jumped back a question and, and rewound, and I've totally forgotten what the question was that you asked again. <laughs> <laughs> I do this oh, a lot. That's all right. I love chats like this because and I think the <laughs> listeners love these chats because it's just the eavesdropping <laughs> in on a, a random chat about stuff, <laughs> which is cool. Um, the, the question was, what do people need to learn? Uh, because I think right. it's easy to say, um, you know, don't do it yourself, but have some education, yep. but you've got to draw a line somewhere, haven't you? Yeah, you do. Absolutely. So... What I'd recommend is going out there and, and just, you know, listening to a couple of podcasts, just read a couple of books. You don't have to spend, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of time, but, you know, just have a little bit of interest in the subject. And if you just have that little bit of interest, you'll start to see the same topics and the same things come up over and over again. And they're the bits of information that you'll need in order to have a conversation uh, with a web developer. And I, I've always got this line with, you know, uh, clients that I work with. And, you know, because they always used to ask, uh, can you do this? And I would always used to say to them, the question is not, can you? It is how long and how much? So that's, that's always your leading question. How long and how much would it take to do this? If there's something that you want to do with regards to your website, the chances are someone else has already done it. And if you can find someone else that's already done it and you can uh, replicate uh, how they've done that, then, you know, you're a mile in front with regards to, um, getting website work done. But just learn the basics. A couple of books, a couple of blog posts, a couple of podcasts, that'll give you enough of a foundation. But um, would you like my kind of express three things you absolutely must have on the homepage of your website? Nice Ab place to start? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. So uh, now this this is not just information for people that either don't have a website or, or are very early on in the piece. This is also a very important piece of information that I have to share with uh, bigger companies. I've been working with a, um, uh, a builder recently who turns over tens of millions of dollars, and I went and had a look at their website, and it was, look, let's not use the word garbage. Um, <laughs> it was pretty bad, though. And I walked in, and the first part of the conversation is what I'm about to tell you now. I went from they weren't really sure whether they needed to talk to me about this process to, holy crap, where's my pen, where's my paper? I need to furiously scribble notes. How have I missed this? So here are the three things that I told them. And it's all with regards to what appears above the fold on your website. Now, a, a quick um, explanation. Above the fold on your website means what do people see either on a computer or on a mobile phone or on a tablet before they have to scroll on your website. Now, why is that important? Well, you know, I can ask the listeners out there to tell me why that's important because uh, we can say, you know, and let me ask you, Ben, like, have you ever clicked away from a website within the first few seconds of going to a web page? Yes or no? I'd say definitely and probably subconsciously. <laughs> Exactly mm. right. And that's the key. This all happens subconsciously, but I'm just going to kind of bring it to conscious awareness now. Mm. So you've clicked away from a page in the first few seconds. Can I ask you why? What are some of the reasons you clicked away from that page? I probably felt it was irrelevant. Maybe, um, yep. yeah, maybe, maybe the advert or the link description that I clicked on um, didn't give me the answer that I wanted when I, when I arrived. Yep. That would be one yep, of the big reasons. Um, the second, yep. second reason would be that it didn't look very good. Like I, I'm, I'm a, quite a visual person and I can't stand it when I go to these really old clunky websites that have um, weird tiled backgrounds and they've been made, you know, back in the 1990s on Yahoo Site yep. Builder or, you know, Dreamweaver, I don't know, yep. something, I don't, yep. know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but, you know, some old thing. Um, uh, what about uh, page load time, if it takes too long to load? Oh, de definitely. I'm extremely impatient Born. and I'd forgotten about that one, but <laughs> if it takes too long, I'm out of there. So, so for anyone listening, sit down, just take the time. You're probably thinking in your head while I'm talking, like, what are some reasons you've clicked away from websites? And then have a look at your own website and see if you actually are breaking some of the rules that you just told me you'd click away from websites for, because that's a great starting point. And you, what you've also told me there, Ben, is the fact that you've literally got just a few seconds 
to make an impression with your customer when they come to your website. So people go, when I go and check out their website, give them a review, I might look at it and they might say, um, hey, look, if you scroll down, you can find that information here. And I'm like, you've already lost me. As soon as you say scroll, forget about it. It's like uh, a book, a book in a bookshop. Not that that's something that's common these days, but it, when you talk about selling a book in a bookshop, the first thing you need to capture the attention of a customer is the, the cover and the title. If you haven't got a, a cover and a title that'll capture the attention, forget it, you've lost them. Then if you do get their attention with that cover and the title, they might flip the book over and read the back. Then if it's good enough, they might flip it over and open the table of contents and maybe flick through a few pages. But if you don't capture them with that cover and that title, then you have lost them and they will not be a customer of yours at all. So the same theory applies to your website. You've got to capture their attention the moment they come to the website. Now, back to those three things that I said. What are those three things? There's three things you absolutely must do above the fold on the home page of your website. Um, or if you're doing advertising uh, and you're sending people to a landing page, you need to do these three things as well. Number one, who are you and what do you do? Now, <laughs> this, this seems pretty obvious. But a lot of businesses, their business name might not actually reflect what the business does. Now, there's a business locally in Cronulla where I live that was in the mall um, that was called East Coast Aesthetics. Now, I'm not calling these guys out because I, I was actually really impressed that they were willing to have a go and get a shop front in Cronulla. And I hope their business has moved on. Their shop front has closed, unfortunately, in Cronulla. And they, while they were open, I remember every time walking past with my wife going, what do they do? East Coast Aesthetics. Ben, do you have a guess? What do they do? Oh, <laughs> East Coast Aesthetics. It would have to be something to do with, I think, uh, beach design furniture. How's that? <laughs> yeah, nice guess. I don't think that was accurate. I didn't see any furniture in the shop. Now, mm. to be fair, I don't actually know to this day what they did. I think it was something to do with health, I think. But my point is this. If you have to sit there and ask and quiz and some people aren't convinced or clear on what you do, then you've lost them. Don't make it confusing. Make it very clear who you are so they know they're in the right place and what is it that you actually do. Number two is uh, comes down to what you said about relevance. It is how do I find what it is that I'm looking for? If you go to a website, you don't want to play hide and seek trying to find the information. I've left dozens if not hundreds of websites within the first few seconds because it's like I couldn't be bothered trying to figure this out. Yep, can you relate to this? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, so how do I find what it is that I'm looking for? And that comes down to a couple of things. Number one is a nice clean navigation which is located at the top of the page. And number two is if it's above the fold uh, on a computer, for example, you might want to have just below a banner area, you might want to have a couple of links which link to the pages that you know people are looking for. So how do you know what pages people are looking for? Well, if you haven't got Google Analytics installed on your website, either do it yourself or get a developer to do it. It'll only be a couple of bucks. It's a very easy process to get Google Analytics installed. And that way you can track where people go to on your website and how they interact with the website. Now, if you know, for example, that you have a particular blog post that gets 70% of the traffic on your website, it might be a very good idea to put a link to that on the home page so that people can go to it directly. You want to send people to your best stuff. So how do I find what it is that I'm looking for? The navigation at the top and a couple of quick links. It might be your about page. It might be a gallery. It might be a products page. It might be an FAQs. It might be awards. It might be testimonials. It's different for every business, but look at your analytics figure out where people are going, or if you don't have analytics or you want to feed people down a certain sales path on your website, then they are the things that you should consider. So that's number two. How do I find what it is that I'm looking for? And number three is what's in it for me? I always talk about it as the radio station that everyone's tuned into. W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Um, I used to call this what is the next logical step in our relationship? But people kind of didn't get that too well. So uh, I changed it to 
What's in it for me? So what does that mean? Remember, I take you back to people love to buy but hate being sold to. People want to know, where do you expect me to go from here? Now, that comes down to what I would refer to as an opt-in or a call to action. What action do you want your ideal customer to take? Now, for a business, quite often, like I said, you need to build some sort of trust or build some sort of relationship with customers over a period of time. But we also have in our business what we would refer to as an ideal customer. And an ideal customer who is someone comes to your website, they they see your headline, they realize that this is exactly what they want, they couldn't be bothered going through your entire website, and they just want to take action now. Give them the opportunity to do that. Not everyone wants to do the dance and do the tango and, you know, go through a six-month relationship building process through an email funnel system, which is highly complex. Some people just want to click a button that says request a callback or call us now. Or in some cases, you might want to give away something which has a high perceived value in return for some of their information. So what do I mean there? Uh, back in the good old days, late 90s, early 2000s, I would subscribe to every mailing list on the planet, no problems. But these days, if you want to get my email address, you better believe you have to have something of high perceived value for me to give my email address up in the first place. And I'm sure that's the same with all the listeners out there. So if you can come up with something in your business that has a low cost to you but a high perceived value to your ideal customer, can the question is can you give that away for free or in some cases let's say you might have a book can you give it away for the cost of shipping alone or something like that because again we're trying to get the people from where are you now to taking that first step that call to action to take that next logical step in the relationship what's in it for me and if you can build that bridge you've made a complete success above the fold on your home page. But if you don't tick those three key things off your list, then you've lost your visitor. You've lost your customer. You've lost your prospect because they can't find what it is that they're looking for. They don't know what you expect them to do. They get lost. The next thing you know, their kid's yelling in the next room. Their cat needs to go to the vet and they need to cook pasta for dinner. They've long forgotten your website and they will never find it again. Does that all make sense, Ben? Absolutely, absolutely, and I think um, so many <laughs> right now. So many listeners are probably scribbling down notes. That's uh, that's if they can. If they're not driving along, they'll be listening again later uh, because there's some things that they need to change on their website. And uh, funnily enough, I've actually just googled East Coast aesthetics, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and they okay. don't ha- they don't make any furniture at all. So there you go. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but their but their website actually does sort of. Uh, it's like they have maybe listened to you or bought your book. So because they they oh, have good, that, but it's still not 100 percent clear, which is brings me back to another point is that you can be still a bit um you know oblique in what you when you explain what you do so you know when you say that you've got to be clear on who you are and what it is you do uh, i think mm. listeners need to be really clear on what it is they do they've got here promoting aesthetics of the mind spirit and body and we're giving them a good plug here i don't feel bad at all by uh, by critiquing their website um but that, even that doesn't make a lot of sense to me no and you know what? It's it's one of those things where when it's our own business, quite often you can't see the forest for the trees, mm. right? It's It becomes very difficult because we're so engrossed in it and we know exactly what we're trying to promote. But for someone who doesn't know what you do, do they know what you're trying to promote? And, you know, again, like I said, I, like full marks to these guys that were in Cronulla. They opened a shop front and every time I see a new shop open, in my local mall, I, you know, I, I feel like I want to support the local business because these people are having a dig. They're having a go. And that's the number one thing, right? Like for most people, what stops them is they, you know, they won't actually have a dig. They won't put skin in the game as, as one of my mentors talks to me about. And, and these guys did put skin in the game and they did have a dig. And I was so impressed that they did, but it's just so obvious to someone from the outside, like myself looking in to go, hey, you need to sort this out because right now you know exactly what you do and once people get to know you and figure out your business, they go, oh, now I understand what you do and, yes, that's awesome, that's amazing. How do more people not know about this? But the fact is you've left a fence up that's left 90% of your prospects 
on the other side because they have no clue and they're never going to try mm. and find out. So this, so this, uh, you know, description or explanation of what it is you do, is this, for want of a better term, a slogan? Is that what that would be? Yeah, that's look, that's a great way to do it. Or um, a slogan, a tagline, or if you have it in your in a heading that's written, um, you know, that's written above your fold. So, so for the, the for the visual people out there, um, you know, they ask me what what do I put visually above the fold, and um, I usually like to have big, bold images that reflect my ideal customer's outcome. So uh, let me just describe that for a second, and then I'll get back to the um, to the uh, what do you do bit. So, for example, let's use a gym example. So I've I've worked with a lot of personal trainers, and one of them came to me with their website, and their picture above the fold was a picture of an. Uh, Let's let's say an overweight person in a cotton t-shirt sweating their backside off with a pair of boxing gloves on, bright red face in a gym, and it's like that is awful. And they said, <laughs> no, no, but that's ex- that's exactly what they're going to get if they buy the product. It's like no, that's not what they want to get when they buy your product. What they want to get is they want to get the outcome. So what's the outcome? And the outcome is hanging out with their friends with a nice slim body standing at the beach during summertime holding a drink in their hand. And we work specifically with with that client and I have with other fitness trainers as well. You know, first of all, you figure out how old is your ideal customer, where do they live, what do they do? And for that one specifically, their ideal customer was actually uh, a woman in their early 20s who was single, uh, dating, and just loved time with their friends. So it's like, well, that's what we want to put uh, on the website in front of them is saying to them, hey, look, if you want to be on a Friday afternoon sipping wines or cocktails with your friends or at the beach in that nice slim dress, then how are you going to get there? We have the solution for you is basically what you're saying. Mm. So back to the – so don't put down the rough stuff, you know, what it is in the image. You want to put down where you want your ideal customer to be headed. But don't make it too cryptic. Your ideal customer should look at it and relate to it instantly with regards to what you sell. So, for example, if people are looking for a personal trainer, just using that example again, if people are looking for a personal trainer, they know in the back of their minds that they want to be looking good. And if, let's say, it's a spring campaign coming into summer, they know they want to be looking good coming into summer. So subconsciously, you're making that connection. And you talked about that before. Subconsciously, you're making decisions all the time but you don't even realize it. So how do you tap into that with your ideal customer? So very quickly back to the text, slogan, tagline, or if it's, say, the personal trainer, you might have that image, and in the headline next to that image, you might have something like, or in a tagline underneath it, you might have something like, uh, you know, let's use the Cronulla example again, um, getting uh, getting fit at Cronulla Beach in time for summer. So you know, all of a sudden, I've kind of mentioned that it's all about getting fit. I've mentioned my location because I'm geo-restricted. Um, and now people aren't in two minds as to what it is that we actually do. You know, we're, we're not kind of making people guess what does this word mean? What, is, what does this company actually actually do? But like you said, slogan, tagline, somewhere in the headline on the page or in text that's written somewhere above the fold, just make sure it's obvious for you. For and, your like, customers. and like I said, there it could change based on things like seasonality. So, uh, mm. you know, help helping you get fit in time for summer. Uh, well, at the end yeah. of summer, it might be helping you keep the winter fat away or something. Yeah, exactly. And again, this comes back to your ideal customer. And I, I wasn't really intending on chatting to you about this, but it is like it comes up all the time. It's so important for any business out there that's listening to this. If you don't have a clear vision of who your ideal customer is. You need to sit down and do that now. Because if I say to you, you know, um, with your, with your business, Ben, who's your ideal customer? And you say, oh, my ideal customer is anyone. It's like, well, the problem you're going to face now is if you, let's use the example of Facebook advertising, right? Just as an example, but this applies to anything. If you use the example of Facebook advertising and you wanted to target anyone on Facebook ads, you're going to pay a lot of money and put your ad in front of a lot of people who are not interested in what you do. 
But if you say, let's say you sold widgets to teenage, uh, to teenage girls aged from 17 to 18 who came from high socioeconomic families in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Yep. Now, if you went to Facebook and rather than saying advertise this to everyone, if you went to Facebook and said advertise 17 and 18-year-old females that live within a five-kilometre radius of Point Piper um, and, you know, let's say the widgets are related to One Direction. I don't know. It's a One Direction fidget spinner. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> and then you click on their, their interests are One Direction. Now, all of a sudden on Facebook ads, you've gone from advertising for, from everyone on Facebook. Now you're advertising to a small group of people who are absolutely your laser-focused ideal customers. Now, does that mean that the 60-year-old bloke that lives down the road in, you know, Bankstown that loves One Direction, does that mean that he won't buy from you? And the answer is no. That bloke will still find you because he still loves One Direction. He still loves his fidget spinners. He'll still find you. He'll still buy but you haven't spent money on 3 million people who are not interested in your product. You've spent money advertising to the 1,000 people who are absolutely interested in your product. Now, if we use that analogy coming back to your website, all of a sudden, if you're advertising, uh, you know, finger spinner, widget, one direction things to teenage girls, you're probably not going to put uh, on the homepage of your website monster trucks. Now, that might sound completely ridiculous, but have a look. I'm saying this to your listeners out there. Have a look at your website now. Are you putting monster trucks on your website when you're trying to advertise One Direction fidget spinners to teenage girls? Be honest when you have a look at your website. And if you're not sure, ask a friend who is not financially, uh, doesn't have a financial interest in your business, who you trust and respect. So when I say a friend, I don't mean someone that has no idea about business. I mean someone that uh, you look up to and respect with regards to your business and say, when you look at my website, do you instantly within the first five seconds know who I am, what I do and what I'm trying to get you to do on my homepage there? And if they don't answer you the same way that you think they should, then you need to change something. Yeah, that's a great tip. Great tip. And you know what? I think uh, it's there's like a, um, uh, I guess, an algorithm or a rule that all these online mediums use, whether it's Facebook or Google, where if people do land on your website, and correct me if I'm wrong, if people do land on your website or they click on your ad and then they they move away quickly, so that is, I think it's called the bounce rate when they go on, and because yep. it's irrelevant, they disappear quickly. Um, even though you may be targeting a certain search term, uh, Google will think your website doesn't answer the question, so they'll stop sending people there. So it actually affects the, your cost per click and the amount of people or the amount of traffic you get, doesn't it? Correct. And you need to think about that with respect to Google and their business model as well. So people think, people come along and they go, oh, Google just want the highest paying advertiser. Pardon me. That's not true. And that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, they would far prefer an ad paying, let's say, 10 cents per click where the person goes to that ad and they get a like a very long time on that website they click through a bunch of pages or they take the call to action or whatever whatever it might be on that page, Google would far prefer showing that ad than someone paying $5 when they go to the site and instantly click away. And here's why. Because if people go to the website and instantly click away, then that reflects on Google as not being a relevant result for that search term. However, if they go to that website, they love it, they spend time there, they take the call to action, whatever it might be, that is a relevant search result. So people go, oh, I love Google. It always gives me relevant search results. So no matter how much money you pay, if your ad isn't relevant and isn't high converting, you will lose rankings on Google to someone who has got their target audience specified very clearly and they have a website that they know that people are going to click on and they are going to absolutely love it. Yeah, so important. So important. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is there's more to it than just, you know, being a smart marketer. There's obviously the technical side to make sure 
that you're not disadvantaged, being well, giving yourself a disadvantage by not being clear. So when you say, you know, who are you and what do you do, and make sure your site's relevant, um, it's really mm. important. And like I think, like I said before, we, we're so busy that when we go to a page and it doesn't load, we get out of there within a few seconds. The same thing happens with a search engine, and I think this is where Google mm. has been really good, is they make sure that when you do a search, you get results fast and they're relevant. So you're not wasting time. Exactly. Yeah. Now you mentioned exactly. Whilst we're on the term uh, or talking about Google, I'm interested to, to just help the listeners understand how do they access these analytics you were talking about? Because there's people that will be listening that are going, how do I get this data? What is Google Analytics? Is this something that's easy for people to get to work out what pages their visitors are visiting? Yes. Yeah, so if you're not sure, uh, again, it's one of those things that I'd probably recommend just, uh, you know, Googling Google Analytics and then just do a, a little bit of uh, reading, a couple of blog posts, a few uh, maybe go to YouTube, watch a few how-to videos, and, and that'll get you started. I think it's actually a worthwhile skill to have under your belt. You don't need to be a, a true expert with regards to analysis of your Google Analytics. As your business grows, um, then I would suggest that if you're earning enough money, if you're doing enough traffic on your website and you're earning enough money through your website, that you're probably in a position whereby you should be hiring a webmaster of some description who can help you with this stuff anyway. So this is something that you shouldn't necessarily upfront need to go, I need to know exactly how Google Analytics works before I move on because that's what Pete said on this podcast. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. Just find out some absolute basics and then what you can do is you can follow some very simple instructions that you'll find on Google or if you, if you go to YouTube, you'll see some visual instructions as well. Just set yourself up a Google Analytics account for your website. And the second you get stuck, don't try and figure it out. Just go out, use something like Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com or Upwork, U-P-W-O-R-K dot com. They're two outsourcing websites where you can actually hire someone else to do the work for you and quite often at a fraction of the cost of uh, finding someone locally, or sometimes they are someone local, but it might be cheaper than going through the more traditional marketing methods. And then if you can hire them, uh, they will fill in the blanks for you and they will add the code to your website. You can even ask them to create uh, in job descriptions on Upwork, you can say, and I'll need you to create a basic video walking me through how to find information on my website in my Google Analytics account. And I've seen people do that before also. So a little bit of reading, watch a couple of YouTube videos. Don't spend more than an hour or two on it. That's plenty. You just need to get a, a broad overview um, if you don't understand, and then you can take it from there. And over time, you'll find that you'll learn a little bit more along the way, and it will just become more and more helpful as your site grows and you start making money off your website. And isn't it a great service? I mean, Google give you that for free. I know they're collecting yeah. data, so they love it. They, they want to do it because you're giving them permission mm. to collect data from every movement on your website. But for you as a business owner, mm. to be able to know where people are going to on your website, how long they're spending on each page, uh, and what, and, and it tells you where the traffic is coming. It tells, just tells you so much information. So really good tip there. And like I said, um, don't let it be the thing that stops you because uh, Pete oh, mentioned it here, uh, you know, but something that you definitely need to do. Um, now, the, the third thing, I'll, you know, that you more mentioned there was the the radio, W-I-I-F-M, when you put your radio voice on. I, yeah. did, I did like that voice. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I've seen so many different things out there. Have you, you know, with your experience having dealt with so many people with websites and, and, and helping so many people get this right, found something that just works gangbusters or does it depend on your market and your business? As to whether it's going to be an ebook, a checklist, a video, or a course, you know, is that something that's easy to consume, takes longer to consume? How do you get it right? Yeah, really good question. And one that I still, I wouldn't say struggle with with regards to, oh, what do I do? But I certainly struggle with, with regards to where do we start when I work with a new business these days because it is so different and it is evolving. Um, you know, I remember. 15 years ago, it wasn't that long ago that you could sell an ebook online for $147. And <laughs> people would buy it. Mm. People spent a lot of money. I know people that got rich um, selling ebooks for, you know, hundreds of dollars. Uh, and then that price slowly went down. And these days, yeah, you can still sell ebooks online, but certainly not at that price point. Um, and then all of a sudden it became an ebook was a great idea for an opt in. But people didn't really pre-think their ebook. You know, for example, um, 
you know, uh, like let's use the fitness example again. The ebook might have been um, three tips to tighter abs. And it's like, it's ho hum, right? When it came out, people are like, oh, yeah, I'll take that. It's a free ebook. Great. They used to be $147. Now they're free. Here's my email address. But in this day and age, if I go to a website that's on training and it's three tips to a tighter belly, it's like, yeah, you know what? I can get that for free anywhere else. And I really couldn't be bothered getting this one. I don't want to give you my email address. So what is the, the winning formula is, what is it that your ideal customer would be willing to exchange this information for? So let's use the email address as an example. What would they be willing to exchange their email address for? What is it that's going to add value to what they do? So for example, you know, a lot of the property people out there at the moment, properties booming big time, lots of property spruikers, and a lot of them are selling, uh, having opt-ins like, um, from an ebook perspective, like here's the five uh, hotspots that have already boomed that you need to avoid, or here's three suburbs that there's no way you would have thought of that are primed to boom in the next six months. You know, you want to twig the interest of your ideal Mm. customer with something that they may not have thought of. It's that whole thing of, uh, you know, if ever I'm putting together blog posts with clients or anything like that, I'll say, what are the seven questions that people ask, the, the most common questions that people ask you in your business? And then the second thing that I ask them is, what are the seven questions that people don't ask and don't know that they should ask, but really should know the answer to? And it's those questions that you really should be looking at working on with regards to your opt-in. But don't sell it with regards to, hey, you need to know the answer to this. It, it's the the old adage of um, sell the people what they want and give them what they need. But use that as a back door, as a, as a little hook, as it were, to, to mm-hmm. find some interesting information that maybe isn't freely and readily available out there online. And as your business grows, you can afford to uh, build a sales funnel. And by a sales funnel, I mean you know, you have more and more products that get more and more expensive as you go along. You know, you might be selling something for $10 right now, but then in the future, you can actually give that away for free because you know that your hard cost on that item, let's say it's, let's say it's a book, for example, you know, you might have, you might have written a book and when you release it, you charge 30 bucks. Then later on, you realize, actually, you know what, I can sell this for $10 because it only cost me $2 to print a copy. I'm still making a profit. Then you might go, you know what, I can actually give this away uh, for the cost of postage, because even though it'll cost me $2 to print that book and it'll cost me a bit of admin to send it out, I know that out of 100 people that get this book, I'm going to sell my uh, $10,000 product to five of those people. So even though it's costing me to send this book out, I know that that's going to convert into clients further down my sales funnel. I know the value of these customers. So you can start thinking of those sorts of things. What can I give away for free now? And later on, give away things of, of greater and greater value. So books, eBooks, uh, video training series are excellent. I've found some really good traction with those. But more recently, with regards to some of my um, construction clients that I've worked with, it's done full circle and it's come all the way back to uh, two buttons. One button says, um, uh, call now or request a callback. And the other button says, or discover more, which takes them to the about page. And I'm finding that the conversion on the call now button is quite massive, that people are going, okay, I don't want any of the BS. I don't want to be run around the bush a hundred times. I just want to call and speak to someone right this minute. Amazing. Yeah, isn't it? Well, (laughs) is it amazing? (laughs) You know, I think um, one of the things I see so many people doing with technology, and I've been guilty of it as well, is trying to, um, you know, take people on a longer journey than they need to go on. If someone's ready to talk to you, then you want to you want to talk to them, you know, really. Otherwise, they're going to find somebody who's willing to talk to them straight away. Uh, same old adage, isn't it? We don't have time to muck around uh, reading eBooks or downloading courses mm. if we're just in a hurry mm. and we want something right now. Yeah, exactly. I I know one of the one of my classic examples is working with a client who did uh, food safety, and it took me so long with this client to get my head around. Hang on, I don't understand what it is you actually do, but when it finally twigged, I laughed because. Basically, food safety comes down to 
If you need to know what it is, you know exactly what it is. If you don't need to know what it is, then you probably have no clue it even exists. But food safety basically comes down to, hey, I have a restaurant, my fridge has gone on the blink and I have this problem with out-of-date rotten food or whatever it might be. Or uh, when, the, when they had the issue with the berries with salmonella poisoning or whatever it was, you know, they need food safety experts and they need them pronto, right? So that client was um, suggesting to me, or it, it can also be um, preventative measures with food safety companies, but people know that they have to uh, deal with government regulations in regards to that subject. So anyway, so we discussed this and I, I said to them, what is it that your ideal customer wants? And they said, if they're Googling me and they've found my website, they don't want to download an ebook. They don't want to build a relationship. They need a result. They need it right now. And they do not want to speak to one of my staff. They want to speak to the person that knows the answers right this second. And I'm like, so why don't we offer them that? Yeah, but then a whole bunch of people are going to call and it's not going to do this. It's not, okay, let's try it and see what happens. Change their business. All of a sudden, CEOs were calling directly on the number listed on the site with a click to call and the line was coming straight through to the business owner who was the person that could actually take action and give them answers immediately. Uh, incredible. Revolutionize their business. So, yeah, so when you're thinking about that, what's in it for me, it doesn't have to be a downloadable product. It can be a, uh, a, a direct line straight through to the problem solver. Yeah, absolutely. But it, look, you know, you can always test things, you can measure things, be careful with your business. You know, you don't want to go down the wrong path. Um, if you're looking for automation, then you certainly don't want personal calls coming through. But yet on the same token, um, through split testing that I've uh, seen and some that I've done myself, if you have a contact phone number on your website, and I'm not talking about a mobile phone number, I'm talking about a landline, um, which you can get easily enough through Skype for a couple of dollars a year and forward it to your mobile phone, which is what I do. Um, if you have a landline phone number on your website, you actually increase conversions on the click to call to action, which has nothing to do with people actually calling you. But the psychology behind that is people see the phone number and they go, oh, it must be a real business. Mm. It adds credibility to the rest of your website. So subconsciously they go, like you said, with regards to, you know, your website wants to look good. That's how you can compete with the big players is if your website looks like you're a professional business, you might be a one man show working out of your garage. No problems. If you've got a website that makes it look like you're professional, then people are going to deal with you as the professional in your industry. So the phone number is another one of those key elements, which you really should have a phone number on your website to help add to the credibility of you and your business. Well, I'll tell you what, there's been uh, some jam this, – this, this whole episode has been jam-packed with some very useful tips, Pete. I'm so grateful uh, that you've come and spent the time with us, buddy. Uh, no worries. I was, I was kind of hoping we'd touch on one like one little subject and maybe uh, talk about that. But in the end, with I hope we haven't overwhelmed everyone. You know, as I always say to everyone, every time I speak, it's like, look, we talked about a lot of things here today, but you just take one, take one. I don't care what it is. Couldn't care less. One thing that we've talked about today and take action on it this week. Just one thing. If you do that, it will make my time spent on this podcast so worthwhile if people take one thing and they action it in their business this week. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, we're just about out of time, Pete. Uh, how can people find out more? So if people want to get in touch with me, they can head to my website. It's petequist.com, and I'll spell it out because my surname is a little interesting. It's P-E-T-E-K-V-I-S-T.com. And uh, you can find out more about me there. As I said, uh, I do a lot of the speaking these days. So if anyone wants to engage me for some speaking or some training, you can do so there. Um, there's also links through to my book, Why Most Websites Suck. If you want to check that out, you can grab a copy off Amazon of, uh, of that little beauty. I always say to people, I wish I hadn't written it because I'd promote it a lot better if someone else had written it. Um, or also, if you would like to work with me specifically, you can just get in touch with me via the contact page on my website and, you know, let's have a discussion to see if we'll be a good fit. Um, I very, 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 very rarely work specifically with individual customers. Um, so this is not something that would be for anyone and everyone out there. But if you've got a business and, you know, you're looking to spend money on a, a 
additional staff, you're looking to scale, then, you know, maybe it's worth us having a conversation and, you know, we can have a pretty short conversation and I know pretty quickly, and I'm sure this is the same with you, Ben, you can figure out whether or not you're a good fit for each other and that's the important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you missed any of those links or anything we spoke about during today's podcast, you can go to businessbrainfood.com.au and it's uh, BBF episode 143. So just uh, search quickly to go to 143 and you'll find this chat with Pete and all the links will be in the show notes. Our good mate Mike Borman over in the UK who looks after the show notes will make sure that every single link, (laughs) a shout out to you, Mike. I know you work hard, buddy. Uh, Every (laughs) single link will be in the show notes to make sure that you, if you're on the treadmill driving the car, Drogging to keep fit, whatever it might be. Maybe you're down at uh, um, that uh, East Coast Aesthetics, getting your mind and body sorted. <laughs> you'll be able to get those, you'll be able to get those links. Well, Pete, there's only one thing left to do, my friend, and that is to do the 60 second scramble. Are you ready for that? Oh gosh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Bring it on me. All right, we're starting <laughs> the clock. Have you got a hidden talent? Uh, hidden talent? Yes, Love Shack karaoke. <laughs> uh, favorite movie. Uh, Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great movie. I got to <laughs> be up there with my favourites. What's the favourite app on your phone? Would be Flight Radar Twenty Four. I love that. I'm a flight nerd. Love it. Yeah, I love watching the flights. What's your biggest addiction? Skiing. Your favourite drink? Canadian Club and Vanilla Coke. If you could be a superhero, who would you be, and why? Uh, Batman, because I already own a T-shirt, so I'm halfway there. <laughs> nice stuff. What's your number one tip for being more efficient? Do something now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good tip. Uh, best way to tune out and relax? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not all day. <laughs> Hopefully. Once again, Pete, hey, it's been a joy, mate. It's been absolutely sensational having you on the Business Brain Food Podcast. I appreciate your time, mate. I'm sure the listeners do too. Uh, all the best in the future, my friend. That's outstanding. I've had a lot of fun, mate, and uh, look forward to – Uh, hearing about some of the conversations that your listeners come up with based on some of the things that we brought up on today's show too. Excellent stuff. Thanks again. Cheers. Edutaining with business brain food. Well, there you go. As Pete said, if you can just take one thing and, you know, implement that or do that this week and, you know, I think I love his answer to what I said. What's your number one tip for being more efficient? Just do something. So, you know, as a result of this podcast, take one thing and go away and do it. If And I reckon that, that the thing that you could do that would be really powerful is, as Pete suggested, go and find a trusted friend who has a nouse about business and ask him to look at your homepage. But ask yourself those three questions first. Does your homepage tell people who you are and what you do? Uh, does it tell people how to find what it is they're looking for? And is there something there that gives them a solution to their problem uh, that they can download or access, whether it's a phone call or it's a cheat sheet or an ebook or whatever? Because I think that, you know, as a business owner, it's easy for us to get ho-hum about our website. It's a bit like, you know, you go to a restaurant sometimes, you see dirty glass or dirty floors or something. The business owner doesn't always see those things because they're there every day. Uh, it's what we call shop blindness. And I think the same thing happens with your own website. I get it. Everyone gets it, right? You get a shop blindness. So it's good to ask other people and be willing to take on that um, the critique of others that you trust because I think there's a lot of power in making sure that your website is working at its optimum. People are going there. People are checking you out online these days and you want to make sure that you are presenting yourself in the best possible way. So once again, Pete, thanks for coming on the Business Brain Food Podcast. Absolutely love the chat. Uh, good all-round guy. <laughs> Great to have another Aussie on the show. And uh, hopefully you got a lot out of that. I'm sure you did. All right. Um, let's uh, let's quickly chat about the Facebook group because on Facebook there is a business brain food group that is awesome and there's a lot of great people in there having a good old conversation about business. And if you're not in there, you're missing out. So go to facebook.com slash groups slash business brain food. Join the business brain food group. Come and join the conversation. We're having a good old chat about all things business. And, you know, we can, we can talk about, uh, you know, interviews or episodes. You can suggest guests. You know, you can communicate with me in there one on one it's a great old you know great place to hang out so please join us in that group I'd love to see you there and just a reminder as I said at the top of the show if you haven't already jump into the iTunes store leave an honest review or rating it actually helps with the searches now with iTunes and podcasting becoming so popular now we spoke to uh uh, to Glenn, I think it was last week about podcasting, and you know he spoke about how 
it is becoming very popular and more and more people are doing it. So it's really important uh, that we make sure that when people are searching for a podcast, we come up high in the results. And the way to do that is to uh, make sure that the uh, reviews, uh, you know, we've got plenty of reviews because the more reviews that we have, iTunes will see that as a good thing and it'll, it'll prioritize us in the searches. So you're actually going to be helping out the show. You're going to be helping out me and uh, helping out anybody who's looking for a great business podcast to listen to. So jump into the iTunes store, leave a nice review or rating, and it will help us all out. And you, my friend, will get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. And who doesn't like that? Everyone, <laughs> everyone likes to get one of those by doing something nice. All right. Well, that's pretty much it for this week. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Absolutely been a blast, as it always is. Um, I've written down a whole bunch of notes myself of what I'm going to do on my website. Hopefully you've done the same. We can all do something to take our business to the next level, and today is absolutely no different. So make sure you do that. Just do one thing and do it well. Until next week, have a profitable day. You can fly high. The Business Brain Food Podcast was brought to you by MaxMyProfit.com.au. MaxMyProfit helps you build a better business. Go to MaxMyProfit.com.au and download your free business planning template, the same template we've used to grow hundreds of Aussie businesses.